Uh, thank you both. Um, as Chris said, I'm not an odonatologist, but I've enjoyed working with a bunch of odonates recently. I'm a paleo entomologist. Oh my. Oh good, this will work. All right, so I specialize, everyone specializes now, of course, and so I specialize in a particular time and place. Um, back before I was in academia, I, I discovered these fossil sites and I knew that they were just so, so wonderful that uh, there was hardly any work done on the insects of these. So I thought, wow, here's an opportunity, I'll jump in. It's like the golden age of discovery in these fossil sites, which it has been. So first let's orient ourselves in time and space a little bit. Here for the non-geologists out there. Oh, you can see my cursor, okay. This is the Cenozoic, this is the time since the extinction of the dinosaurs. So down here, we've got the extinction of the dinosaurs and up here, Oops, and up here we have us, human there beings. There we go. And um, here's the ice age I, up here. Uh, these time units are not, uh, this is not the length of them. They're uh, the proportional length. For example, this is about two, just under uh, 2 million years, whereas this is about 22 million years. So I work in the Eocene, the lower Eocene, this part here. The, the early Eocene, where's my cursor? Oh, there it is, called Eprisian. And that's named after Ypres in Belgium, where the rocks of that age are best exposed to define the age. Um, and at that time, so I work on these fossil sites in British Columbia and Washington. In the early Eocene, the Eprisian, this was region was undergoing uplift, tectonic uplift. And so it was, a, it was a cooler upland in a hot world. Down around Vancouver or Seattle, it would have been mean annual temperatures like Caracas, Venezuela today. But in the interior, where all these fossil sites were, it would have been mean annual temperatures would have been kind of like Seattle or Vancouver today. So this is starts about mid British Columbia and goes for about a thousand kilometers down to Republic in Northern Washington. And these were all little lake basins that, that were formed in this mountainous region at that time. We call this region the Okanagan Highlands. So I don't know of any place else in the world where we see a, a series, a long series of upland fossil sites like this. Lots of wonderful opportunities to look at various different things. Uh, starting out in the north here is Griffwood Canyon Provincial Park in central British Columbia. And you can see the shale exposed here on the, on the cliff face. This would have been the bottom of a lake filling up with mud, you know, the, just sort of sifting down year by year and forming these layers and making a record of the insects and leaves and fish and all sorts of things that lived in and around the lake. And then in um, about central in the series, here's a site in the Thompson River Valley. This is the area that's being hit really hard by forest fires right now. And, uh, you know, we're having a heat wave where I am in Vancouver at the moment. And there's so much smoke in the air, it's like irritating the eyes and all that. So this is part of the regions where they're really hurting right now from forest fires. All these red dots have great insect. Um, records and the black dots are fossil sites that are pretty much just plants and insects aren't known from. So there's lots of sites throughout this region. And then here's another one, the southernmost site at Republic is a, a wonderful place. And uh, there's a fossil interpretive center there that's great to visit, uh, Stone Rose Interpretive Center. You can look up them up online. And this guy, Greg here <laughs> is one of the super finders. Some people just I don't know, you sit next to them and they, they find all the great stuff before lunch and you're still cracking rocks. So there's just some sort of preternatural talent, I guess. And Greg's got that talent, so. Fossil preservation in these sites can be absolutely stunning. You can see this is about, this is a half millimeter scale bar down here and here's a tiny uh, wasp. And we zoom in further, here's your half millimeter scale bar. And you see the tiny, hairs on the wing membrane. So we're really limited in some of these fossils by the amount of detail we can see, we're limited by the lenses, not by the fossil themselves. It's 
you know, it's like amber. It's so good. It's just the only difference with amber is you can't turn it around. Um, beautiful stuff. And sometimes we get this um, soft tissue preservation as well. These tiny larvae are only a couple of millimeters long. And you can see that there's a lot of detail. I've built up, you know, uh, a, uh, uh, many thousands of fossils and I will try to work through them before I die. So we've got lots and lots of material and wonderfully preserved. One of the um, lace wings I was working at, green lace wings I was working at with uh, Vladimir McCarkin showed uh, internal soft tissue genitalia. <laughs> That's how good this can be. That's how good this stuff can be. So I've been motoring through uh, a lot of the groups with, like the Neuroptera and uh, various other groups um, with taxon experts in each, each one. And at a certain point, it became time to look at the uh, Odonata. So I teamed up with uh, Rob Cannings, who's an odontologist emeritus at the Royal BC Museum. And we described the dragonflies a couple of years ago, I don't know, 2018, I guess. And we had uh, nine fossils, and uh, which we cut up into eight species. Almost all of them were in the Asian today. And one of them, oh, one of them was in the Gomp today. So they, uh, these all look re really modern. They wouldn't look at all different. They wouldn't look out of place if you were to see these fossils, uh, these insects flying around next to a lake today. And with fossil insects, mostly what you get are isolated wings. So I've learned a lot about, well, a bunch about wing venation. And it was nice to be working with Rob who looks at things from a modern insect point of view and, and you know, can understand more about the genitalia and all of those sorts of things. So it's, it's been a pleasure working together. Then we, uh, so we, we published that paper. And then we went on to what we thought all the rest would be Zygoptera, the uh, damselflies. But little did we know. So we had 78 fossils in that group. And uh, this was gonna be a much bigger chore because they didn't look at all modern like the dragonflies did. So we brought a bunch of people on board, Seth Bybee and his student, uh, Robert Erickson from Brigham Young University. And um, Rolf Matthews, a paleoecologist from here at Simon Fraser University. So the bunch of us took on these fossils and it was a long journey. Um, Here's one that we placed in the, the genus Disagrion. And like I say, I, I work a lot with wings. So uh, obviously these four wings are overlapping and they need to be um, separated. So I imported this image into uh, Illustrator and color coded these and did each one on uh, a different layer. And as you can see, made color coding for hind wings and, and fore wings. And in that way, I could separate out the wings. Yeah, it did take a lot of work, but it's worth it because, uh, well, here's the result. And there's a lot you can tell from this. So uh, yeah, this one we put in Disagrion. And so Disagrion is an extinct genus of the extinct family Disagrionidae. And here's another species of Disagrion. Um, described about 150 years ago by Scudder uh, from the Green River Formation of Colorado. So this is, this is pretty great, pretty interesting. I, I love these kind of comparisons because the Green River would have been, the Okanagan Highlands were these cool uplands in a warm world of high atmospheric carbon. And the um, Green River Formation, not that far away in Western USA, is a, a, a hot lowland climate. And here we see a lot of di differences and similarities. And maybe by the time we get the Okanagan Highlands really characterized, uh, we'll be able to make some detailed ecological comparisons, which will be great, but that might not be for 50 or 100 years. So that's how you got to look 
on those time scales. So uh, we cut this up into, we, almost all of these were in Disagrionidae. We figured um, 72 out of the 78 were in this extinct group of Sagrionidae. And uh, we had, I think it was five new genera and then the genus Disagrion. So we ran into a lot of problems. Well, interesting opportunities to learn some interesting things. And uh, one of them was that Disagrionidae has been defined in various different ways for over 150 years. Um, and so it needed, needed to be revised. We needed to go back and look at 150 years worth of literature and figure out why people assign certain genera and certain species to the family and, and, and how the diagnosis has changed in that time. And we found that, you know, the way people do entomology, you know, has changed in a you know, century and a half and uh, you know, taxon concepts have changed and all that. So it took quite a while before we could build a new diagnosis, a new definition of the group, a workable one, and then decide what, which genera belong in it and which we should exclude. So that, that, was, that was a long process. And uh, so here's a new genus, Okanagrion. The species Hobani has a lot, we found a lot of specimens, which was interesting. This is a hind wing. Here's a four wing. And that was interesting because I really enjoyed Dennis Paulson's talk on, on diversity. One of the things that he brought up, which fits perfectly with all this, is when you have a high diversity high species richness uh, community, there's gonna be a few that have a lot of specimens and then most everything else is gonna be rare. Now I did my, my PhD on diversity, species diversity at a fossil site here in the Okanagan Highlands versus a modern site in Costa Rica and a modern temperate forest in Massachusetts. And my findings was that in this temperate upland of mid-latitude North America, we have a uh, species diversity similar to that of a lowland tropical rainforest in Costa Rica. That's a long story. And, but uh, so that was, that was a fun project. And so we find, as you might predict, we find uh, a few species that are rather common and a lot of really rare species. So Okanagrion hobani, was found a number of species, a number of specimens rather. Here's another four wing. But also you gotta remember that these sites in the Okanagan Highlands are um, little lake beds amongst mountains, mountain ranges, deeply incised valleys of high mountain peaks in between them. Jansen did a, a famous and wonderful study called Why Are Mountain Passes Are Higher in the Tropics where he showed that I won't go into this in any detail, but he showed that the overturn of species groups and communities across mountain uh, mountainous region in the tropics, there's a high overturn. There's greater difference across a landscape than there would be with the same kind of um, topography and, and topology in the, uh, in the uh, temperate zone. And sure enough, across these Okanagan Highlands sites, there's a great turnovers of species uh, from community to community. But we see some shared between some fossil sites and we found this between uh, two of the sites I showed you, uh, the Maccabee site and the uh, Republic site. And we also found obviously not all perfectly preserved, beautiful, uh, complete wings, but a lot of broken up ones because these insects, after they die, you know, some of them will be imported into the lake by streams with high energy and be broken up, or some of them might have scavenging or, or have died on being under predation or all sorts of things. So a lot of these wings are gonna be damaged and wrecked up. Here's a bunch of Okanagan Hobani, and then here's a bunch of uh, outer ends of the wings, distal portions. And as you can see, the venation is beautifully preserved in all of these, but sometimes we get them more completely preserved. 
And here's Hobane again um, with some of the uh, male uh, terminalia on it. And the, the, uh, on this particular specimen, the venation is pretty poor, pretty poorly preserved. But we can tell from this one, for example, that the coloration between fore and hind wings uh, were the same, at least in this species. So there's information to be dragged out of all of these guys. Here's a beautiful uh, specimen of another species of Okanagrion. So uh, you can see just how nicely preserved a lot of these are, and the color patterning is quite distinct from what we saw in the bottom. And a uh, one where there is no coloration on the wings. Another genus, Denodiaphanus from Republic. Some of them are easier and some of them are harder. Let's just see. Uh, yeah. Oh, here we are. Um, in this one, we can show you that when you split the, the shale, this lake bed shale, it, it comes apart. And we have what we call the part and the counterpart, the two halves that you split. And each part may have different bits of the fossil on it, each side. I've flipped one of these left to right so that you can compare them easily, but there should be mirror images of each other. And you can see in all the drawings we use venation, we use parts of, from both the part and the counterpart. Like you can see here, it's all missing in the middle, um, but it's really complete out here. On the end. And on the other side, it's present in the middle and at the base, but it's missing here. So we add the part and the counterpart together. Sometimes we only have one side because that's all that was collected by someone you know, 50 years ago or whatever. And some of them are a lot more challenging to work on. And so we need to get information from the part and the counterpart and do a lot of work under the microscope. So this project, <laughs> this pro 70, uh, 78 fossils. So this project did take years to do and to figure out what Dysagrionidae is and how many species and all that. Now, something that we use in paleontology um, that, you, that ne neon, neo entomologists might not be that familiar with is uh, sometimes it's useful to use paratexonomy. And parat here, for example, we could tell that this belongs to the Dysagrionidae, and we can tell that this is a species different than any other Dysagrionid species. But it's missing the character states that we would need to assign it to a genus. So it's a, a species of undefined genus of the known defined family. And how do we treat it then? Well, there's a, there's a method called paratexonomy, which is, uh, which is governed by the, uh, by the ICZN or ICZN, um, by the code, international code. And in this, you can, you can have a taxon, which is not a phylogenetic taxon. So it's not, it doesn't say that this genus is related to regular genera in any sort of ways. You don't have a diagnosis. You don't have a type species. You've got a definition. And the definition of this parataxon is all species of Dysagrionidae that can be distinguished as species but where the genus affinity is not known. And we assume that in the future, these will go to some good uh, phylogenetic genus, but this is like a holding bin for them. But it's useful for us to, to name this species and say, this is a species. And then we can say, oh, it occurs here or there, or et cetera, et cetera. So parataxonomy, useful in paleontology. Also, people use it, for example, deep sea dredging and they dredge up some larvae and they don't know what adults they go with. So they can put them in a parataxon. Or botanists, they find a bunch of fossil wood at a site and they don't know what leaves they go with. And so they'll have a parataxa for the wood example. So here's one named after this fellow Graham Beard who's a wonderful guy and contributed a lot to British Columbia paleontology over the years. Another Okanagrion. Uh, this one had the head preserved. We started to see more of these with the heads preserved. And um, 
So Rob Canning started saying to me, you know, Bruce, it doesn't look a lot like the dam supply heads I'm used to looking at. And um, here's a, another genus, Okanopteryx. This species also has the head reserved. This one has uh, the male terminalia nicely uh, preserved on here. So that's rather nice. But the head is what we started to become more and more interested in. What's going on with these, with these heads? And here's the same species, another specimen with the head well preserved once again. So we started focusing, we started looking a lot at dam supply heads, at the, uh, the suborder Zygoptera, that's the dam supplies. And dam supply heads are distinct and very, very distinctively shaped. They, they um, are very short between here and here. The, the head is very short front to back, not including the mouth parts and all that. The eyes bulge out. They tend to be uh, spherical and bulge outward. They're not sort of adpressed to the head. And um, they're separated by usually about twice the width of one eye. And this is, this is uh, goes throughout. This is very conservative. I mean, they vary. You can see here, they're, they're, a bunch of them are varying, but um, those aspects of it tend to be are conservative within the suborder. The only other thing which is going to bind the suborder together as, as diagnostic for all of them is uh, some details of the male secondary genitalia, which you're not going to really see preserved in fossils. I mean, maybe if you get lucky in an amber fossil, or um, but it's going to be pretty rare and it's something you can't depend on. So we started looking through the literature. We thought, well, these are really weird. Our, our disagrionids, all of our disagrionids have this weird head where the eyes are close together and they're adpressed to the head and they're not shaped like globular, like a little sphere. They're, they're more like a bean, I guess, shape. And they're longer front to back. So we went through 150 or so, 100 and, I don't know, 60 years of literature. Here's, here's uh, one from the family Cebloceidae, described in 1858 by Hagen, and uh, from Germany. And in it, he said the head's been flattened. He assumed that this head had been squashed, basically, during the fossilization process. And we found what we found was that two families, the Desagrionidae, which is known also from Europe, fossils of this age from Europe, and the Cebloceidae, which are all from, from Europe, all of the fossils where the heads are preserved have this odd shape, and we didn't see it elsewhere. So this is starting to turn out to be a pretty interesting story at this point. So now we need to talk about, all these authors had, had assumed that these, this was, these heads were somehow distorted or squashed during, uh, the fossilization process. Fossilization process is called diagenesis. That's after an organism has entered the, the mud or the, the sediment and the lithification takes place. And uh, that's fossilization, that's diagenesis. So what we started looking at was the process of this subdiscipline of paleontology called taphonomy. And taphonomy is the study of everything that happens between the time an organism dies, goes, enters the, the rock, uh, enters the mud, becomes fossilized and diagenesis, is collected and winds up on your lab bench. And that's taphonomic factors affect that. For example, uh, I mentioned earlier that some of these wings are broken up because they might've undergone some high energy uh, circumstance like uh, you know a rapidly flowing, inflowing river or stream transporting to the lake. Or they may be preyed upon by, I don't know, frogs or something else uh, during the time that it's floating on, on the, the water surface. Or it could just decay, something to do with the weather. Um, and then eventually it breaks through the surface tension and, and goes to the bottom of the, uh, of the lake. And if it's near the shore, it's probably gonna decay or be scavenged. But if it's way out in the middle of the lake, where it's going to wind up down in the bottom where it's really cold and maybe anoxic or low oxygen levels, 
it's going to just stay there sitting on the bottom until more of this, this organic material just rains down year after year and, and covers it really gently in, in this fine layer of, um, of mud. So um, here we've got a bunch of male ants floating on the surface of a lake after their nuptial flight and they've done their business and that's it for them. This, this is what it's gonna look like, these insects that I'm finding in these fossil sites, except like I say, these ones aren't gonna enter the fossil record because um, they're too close to shore and they're gonna wind up in the mud in the bottom. It looks like you're only, you know, very shallow. Um, our fossils though, the beautiful preservation that we see is probably due to diatom blooms. Diatoms entered the uh, freshwater realm from the marine realm not that long before the Okanagan Highlands fossil beds. And so these form one time, you know, per year in cycles, these form these blooms that act as sticky traps for fossils to, uh, for insects and leaves and things get stuck in them and then transported to the bottom at the end of the bloom. Now, another taponomic factor is that um, the surface area to volume of an insect is gonna affect the chances of it being fossilized. So a beetle is gonna go right through that surface tension and wind up in the bottom pretty quickly. Whereas a butterfly is gonna sit in that surface tension probably till it decays. And you're, so you're gonna have an underrepresented butterfly population in the fossil record and uh, a well-represented, you know, locust and beetles. However, but um, if you've got sticky trap at the top and diatoms, it's going to it's going to sort of uh, work against. It's going to help preserve everything more. And so we see a high representation of of high surface area insects like lace wings, and we see all these damselflies. So there's all these things going on. And then of course the last taponomic factors are going to be were you collecting on a sunny day or a cloudy day? How well are you seeing the insects in the rocks? At any rate, so those are the things that we have to, to consider. And so using this to understand if those taphonomic factors understand if these heads have been distorted or if these heads are, uh, are the actual shape of the fossil. After diagenesis, at, during or after diagenesis, the rock may actually be kind of squished by geological shear forces. And here's what it looks like when that happens. This is a marsh fly, um, Bibiana day, from a site where there has been this kind of squishing happening, these geological shear forces. And you can see, you just look at it, you see this has been altered, the whole body. It's not going to alter the head differentially and leave the rest of the insect. It's gonna alter everything and leaves and fish and everything there. So this is clearly not what's happening with, with all of these odonates that we're looking at because it's only the head is being affected. So I mentioned that these, this is, these heads are only are found throughout the Cebloceidae and the Dicegrionidae. Here's a Cebloceid from France. And we see this head again. Look at the, this is very narrow between the eyes, about one eye width and the eyes are adpressed to the head, not bulging out like spears. And this is rather long, uh, this head relative to its width. And we look at the, the whole fossil here, we, this is not distorted like that March fly was. So we're building up a case that this is not, these are not, these heads aren't squished. These were the actual shapes of the head during life. And that's our argument and we've got all of this evidence. So we compared that with the, uh, with the uh, Zygoptera and we realized once again that the defining, the diagnostic character states of the Zygoptera, the, the definition has to do with, boils down to the shapes of the head and the secondary male genitalia. And so because our Cebloceidae and Dicegrionidae are so different, we decided to separate them as their own subfamily, extinct subfamily. And here is how we defined it. That, let's just see. The head about two times, oops, 
The head is about in Zygopter and the damselflies is about um, twice the length of the front end to the back end. Whereas, oh, sorry, um, here it is about twice the length. Whereas in Zygopter, the damselflies is about three to five times as wide. And the compound eyes, which are, um, this is Dysagrion from the Green River Formation. These guys, actually, all these heads. So the compound eyes are adpressed to the head, whereas they're bulging outwards sp spherically in the zygopter. And the, head, the eyes are separated by about one eye's width in the Dysagrionidae, um, whereas they're separated by about two eye's widths in the, um, in the zygopter. Let's see if I can move this. Yeah. So that's 72 of the 78 fossils. Then we found five fossils that were just really weird and didn't seem to fit anywhere. Um, and we, we made the, a new family for them. But unfortunately, these are only known by wings. Here's one wing and here's another wing. But as you can see, they've got these really long, this really long pterostigma here, uh, not like in any damselfly. And some of this characters down here, the arculus close to uh, AX1 here, and a bunch of technical details like that make these very odd. However, the rest of the wing, or much of the rest of the wing, is, is very close to this Dysagrionidae, Seedlosiidae group. So we tentatively associated this family, the Huetquataxidae, with uh, the Cephalozygopter as well. But that's, like I said, a tentative association. Now, um, these five specimens were found on the, the uh, traditional lands of Colville tribal people in Northern Washington. So we went to the tribal elders and asked if they could provide a word for us uh, with which to name this genus and therefore family. And they, they, were, uh, they provided us with the word quetquetox, which in their language means dragonfly-like insect. So the genus became quetquetaxa, and uh, uh, the family put what tax it is. So that brings us up to uh, what is it, 77 out of 78 specimens. And the last one, um, oops, the last one is a euphyid. So it's a damselfly of a modern family, which today is mostly known from Southeast Asia, beautiful metallic colored wings. So what we've got here is, is an assemblage where the dragonflies are really modern, look pretty normal, and the rest of the odonates are uh, not at all modern. Well, in fact, this subfamily, this Euphyidae, is an extinct, rather odd subfamily that has been assigned within the family. So everything else looks, looks weird. The Cephalozygopter, the extinct suborder, and then the single Euphyid, which is of a, a distinctive extinct subfamily. So now I want to take you through um, a bit of their world, the world of the uh, of the cephalozygopter and 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 how this um, how they live. So the oldest fossil that has been assigned to the to the and, and to the cephalozygopter is, is one from the uh, early Cretaceous of China. So you know, a, a lot, lot older than our Eocene material. Then the next time we see the uh, Cephalozygoptera is possible occurrences in this age, the late Paleocene in Alaska and uh, France, uh, one specimen each. So they're, they're pretty rare, rare as hen's teeth and um, um, only tentative occurrences. Then we come into, this is the Paleocene. So then we come into the Eocene, next the, the area I'm most familiar with, and in the Apresian. So here, I'm gonna tell you now why the Eocene is so interesting, I believe. The Eocene starts with this, this is a mean annual temperature curve throughout the Cenozoic. Here's the extinction of dinosaurs once again, and here's us, here's the ice ages up here, here's us. These are proportional now. So you can see the Eocene is a big chunk of real estate in the uh, Cenozoic. The Eocene starts with this climatic event, this huge spike of mean annual temperature. 
and then goes through this hot part of the world of the time, declining temperatures, a little jump here, and then this dramatic decrease at the end. So it starts with a the huge climatic event and ends with a huge climatic event. This is right at the boundary, the defining at the boundary between the Paleocene and the Eocene. This is extremely interesting to climate modelers now because what happened here, it, it's called the PETM. If you want to look it up, Google it, go to Wikipedia or whatever. There's been a lot of work done on this. What happened was there was probably uh, several thousand gigatons of carbon dumped into the atmosphere and ocean over a geologically brief period of time, like 20,000 years. And then causing a, a hot period of the earth uh, uh, before this could uh, go away, this carbon be absorbed back into the system. So the whole event was probably about 200,000 years. And it's a very, it's of great importance to modern climate modelers because it sort of mirrors what we're doing today. So you look at the onset of the PETM and it's kind of like what's happening now. Um, now, many of you or every one of you probably saw this uh, UN report on global climate change that came out earlier this week. And they warn about the, the tremendous effect that a 1.5 degrees C increase in um, global temperatures, the tremendous effect that would have on us. Well, here at the PETM, it probably, uh, it is estimated that it increased global temperatures between five and eight degrees C. So it shook everything up quite a lot. And there was extinction events, um, origins afterwards, and range changes of things between continents. A lot of things were shifted around. It was a big shakeup of the world. Then we get, down here, this is where the Okanagan Highland sites are that I'm looking at in the early years. Remember the effusion? A high carbon content in the atmosphere, but we're up at some elevation, remember? So we're at a cool place in a warm world, which is what makes this very interesting to me. So we get down to the end of the Eocene here and we get this big drop. And uh, I believe in French, uh, please excuse my bad pronunciation, the Grand Coupure, I believe the great cut. And at this time we see um, probably uh, a change, a lot of changes in global climate. Uh, but in, during the Eocene we had low equator to pole temperature gradient. So there wasn't that much difference. It was difference between the poles and the equator, but not as much as today. The, the, the balance shifted a lot after this, after this time. We probably had an increase in seasonality. Up in the Eocene it appears we had uh, at least during the Okanagan Highlands times, we have had low temperature seasonality, so the winter wouldn't have been that much different than the summer. But we're going to have onset of probably greater seasonality after this huge event here. Uh, we start. We this is the this is the cutoff point between what we call the greenhouse world climates and ice house world climates. Greenhouse world climates of globally warm temperatures. Uh, no glaciation and the poles and all that extend way back to the uh, late Paleozoic. And that all ends here all of a sudden at the Eocene Oligocene boundary. Now we've got a, a time when there was glaciation in Ar Antarctica and at some points um, in the northern uh, poles as well. And we have high temperature seasonality and a bunch of other things. So various events happen here. For example, the South America and Australia pulled away from Antarctica tectonically enough to establish a circumpolar, uh, an Arctic, Antarctic current, which would have sequestered cold waters around Antarctica. And, and uh, there wouldn't have been the same heat transport from low to high latitudes. The ocean became layered and affecting the transport of heat. All sorts of things happened. Here in the Miocene, uh, the Indian subcontinent crashed into um, Asia, uh, uh, uplifting Himalayas, et cetera. So we can look at this and read a lot of geological events just by looking at the temperature. So this is, this is where I'm looking. And so this is where we're seeing the Dysagrionidae in our beautiful record of them in our British Columbia and Washington fossils. Uh, so because 
we had low temperature seasonality in these fossil sites, we see a very odd mixture of communities. So we see temperate associated insects like a bunch of sawflies, groups of sawflies, and these snake flies there mixed with a bunch of tropical associated insects like these uh, cockroaches, diplopterine cockroaches. And we also see this in plants. We see uh, forests that contain spruce, like you'd expect in boreal forests, and palms. So you have a spruce palm forest. Uh, you know, just really weird associations of things that are, the world is, is getting a lot of modern groups, but they're associated in different communities. And we can have, we, what we assume is that we can have these tropical associated plants and insects here because they may not actually require heat. They may just really dislike cold winters. So up here in the Okanagan Highlands, we probably had no frost days, but we had a, a low mean annual, te well, temperate mean annual temperature, allowing these organisms to, uh, to live together in the same community. And don't forget, this was a high diversity community like the tropics, even though it's mid latitude and temperate. So what we're looking at is a time back here in the Okanagan Highlands where these tropical and temperate mix of, of animals and plants would have lived throughout much of the globe. And after a certain point, and I'm guessing it'll turn out to be the Eocene Oligocene boundary, there was a, a filtering out or a, a sifting out and things that couldn't withstand cold winters would be restricted to low latitudes and, and things would start looking more like the communities that we see today. There's a lot of work still needs to be done on this, but this is what it's looking like at this point. And also, like I say, we had a high species diversity up into high, up into higher latitudes. Here we are, in Okanagan Highlands up here. And also, this is being mirrored down in Patagonia fossil um, sites in Patagonia of the same age, early Eocene, which is the high diversity is now restricted more to the lower latitudes. So this looks like what I would call a pear-shaped diversity pattern in the Cenozoic. We have this extinction event at the beginning, then high global diversity uh, until you get to the, um, probably until you get to the Eocene Oligocene boundary and then lower diversity to modern times. And then, you know, <laughs> we're killing everything now. So kind of an attenuation right now. That's the model. That's what it's looking like to me. So, in insect communities of the Okanagan Highlands, we see three distinct, well, I'm calling these three groups, three general groups. Unlike in some other organisms, we see a bunch of really ancient Mesozoic looking things surviving into the Eocene and then they're gone. So like this, this group of walking stick, of stick insects were known previously from the Jurassic. And uh, so now we're seeing them here in the Okanagan Highlands and then they're gone and a bunch of other groups as well. Uh, so that's one group is those that are persisting from very ancient times. Um, I'm working right now with a bunch of Orthoptera, which look very, very ancient and uh, which are gone by the end of the year, for example. Oops. Uh, another group that we see are groups that we first see in the Eocene and then are gone at the end of the Eocene or, or shortly after, I guess, like these very strange um, scorpion flies, the whole Corpidae. So that's the second group, groups which are just belong down here in the Eocene or maybe uh, Eocene Oligocene, and then they're gone. And then the third group that we're, that we're seeing are modern things that either appear for the first time or go way back into the uh, Cretaceous, but were relatively small and not diverse community elements up until the early Eocene, and then they blossom out and start really diversifying, like ants. Ants probably go way into the early Cretaceous. Well, they do, they're fossils, but they were, like I say, small elements until this time, and then suddenly they start bursting out in diversity. Or bees. Bees are controversially in, in the Cretaceous, but there's certainly one or two, I guess two specimens in the Paleocene of France. And then we start to see them burst out into the, in the early Eocene, in the Okanagan Highlands and in some other places as well, like uh, amber from India, et cetera. So there's a change going on in the Eocene. There's a change going on where 
it's the end of some things. It's the, the home of some things that only lived around this time. And it's the beginning of other things, not necessarily the, the earliest known members of certain important groups, but it's the, it can be, but it can also be the time when those groups expanded. And we, we get to see the, the beginnings of the modernization of the world. Another aspect is that there was inter, a great intercontinental movement at that time. Now, this is an old uh, figure that I made back in, I don't know when it was, 2011, I guess. Uh, it's, this view has been changed a little bit now. But here's Okanagan Highlands down here in North America. You could have walked from Vancouver to Vladivostok across the Bering Strait through forest all the way without getting your feet wet. So there's a lot of tax, a lot of groups in the Okanagan Highlands, which are maybe only found in East Asia today, plants like Katsura or Don Redwood, et cetera. And some insects groups, which are really similar in the Eocene of, of Pacific Coastal Russia and our region. But you could have also walked uh, through forest all the way onto Greenland. And at times through this northern route, where is my cursor? This northern route into Scandinavia, across the top of the, the North Sea, the North Sea, or down through the Faroe Islands, uh, the UK, and across where it's the English Channel now onto Europe. Now, more recently, it's been discovered that these two land bridges weren't happening at the same time. So, the, so there's probably, when this was happening, there would have been water in here. And when uh, this was happening, this land bridge would have been water in here. But the point is that there was a great mix up amongst the Northern hemisphere of plants and animals. This is the time of the greatest similarity of mammals between Europe and North America of any time in history. This is called, the, we call the Turgai Straits separating Europe from Asia for periods uh, across about where the Urals are today. And so this came and went. At times the Arctic Ocean was a um, enclosed body of water with, with fresh water on top. So this is gonna really affect how we see insect communities and how things are mixed up and, and affect their, uh, their change through time. So let's look at the Cephalozygopter in particular. Here we are in the Eocene. Here's the Okanagan Highlands sites for our Disagrionids. And I, I put in our Wekwetaxidae here in blue. And at the same time as they were in this cool upland, here they are, is that Disagrion down here in Colorado. And this beautiful fossil site at Florissant, where there's a national monument and an interpretive center, this is the end of the Eocene right before that um, big downturn in climate. So this is, this is early in the Eocene, these four places, and this one is right at the very end with Disagrionidae. And then at the end of the Eocene, that's the end of Cephalozygopra in the Western Hemisphere. This is it. Now we got to move to the uh, to Europe and Asia. So here we are in Eocene Europe, and we first see them a few million years before the Okanagan Highlands and Denmark here. And this is right at or right after the uh, the PETM uh, climate event. So this is really cool to see the, really interesting to see the, the uh, assemblage here in Denmark. This one in Germany is about, also early as seen about the same time as the Okanagan Highlands. And it makes for a wonderful comparison. Don't forget, things are migrating back and forth with ease from North America to Europe at this time. And then these, here's a one in amber, which is only partially preserved. And what, this amber one is the very, Baltic amber is very late Eocene, and in the UK also very late Eocene, just before the, uh, that crashing event. And this represents one found in uh, Pacific coastal Russia, just across the Bering land bridge. So this is, these red ones are Disagrionidae. We haven't seen the Seablocidae yet. And here, once we pass through that big climatic downturn into the Oligocene, we see the only cephalozygopter are Seblocyads, and we see them in Europe only. Uh, from Russia over here through Germany and um, France. So now we see the Seblocyidae. And then we get up into, we're leaving the Oligocene now, we're going into the Miocene. And we see one possible disagrionid here, and then one which is which we put in so a single disagrionid here in Bulgaria, 
And that's the end of the Sagrionidae. So they're really big in, in North America and the Eocene, and they have some presence, lots of species, lots of genera in North America. We see some Disagrionids in the Eocene of Europe, and then capitalist scrappy occurrences in the Miocene. And here we see uh, the C. blasiidae once again in the Miocene. Here's Miocene's also a long period. These ones here in France and Spain are up here in the Tortonian. So this is near the end of the Miocene. These are the last records of C. blasiidae, and therefore the last records of Cephalozygoptera. And then that's it. They're done. They're gone. So what's next for uh, looking at odonate fossils? What projects are going on? Um, you know, fossil insect people are uh, really, uh, there's not a lot of us, you know, we could fit into a, in North America, that we could fit into a large elevator without pumping elbows too much. And there's tremendous, there's tremendous fossil record. And so there's lots and lots to do. But the point is, is that a lot of these fossil sites that I look at, you know, botanists, paleobotanists went through and uh, people looking at the fossil fish and they find these fossil insects and they put them in boxes somewhere in the back of the museum and they wouldn't get looked at. And I come along and the museum curator goes, oh, great, look at these, you know, put names on them for me. So I get to look at the built up fossils from 150 years of collecting. And so there's this great number that I had got to look at for this project. And what that means is that the new fossils are gonna be kind of scarce. But here's an interesting one uh, from the Allenby Formation, very southernmost British Columbia. Now this looks like the kind of fossil that only a paleoentomologist could love. It's really scrappy, it's really wrecked up, it's fold folded over here, but there's stuff we can do with it. So I bring it into Illustrator and uh, draw the wing from both the part and the counterpart. And the blue part here is the folded over bit. And so therefore we can unfold that graphically. And here it is in black unfolded. We're still just working on this guy, but it looks like uh, another Aishnid, which is absolutely unsurprising. And we probably won't get to a genus or species with this guy. So it's probably gonna be Aishnid A, genus A, species A. But it is of interest, and it's of interest because it could show that there's, you know, how many species there are. And we're also in the region. Also, we're filling in the gaps because these are not known from the Allenby Formation. And that's of interest. Uh, British Columbia, we had the gold rush, the caribou gold rush in the 1860s, when BC was still a, uh, a colony of, of Britain. And British Columbia entered Canada in 1871, so not that long ago, really. Uh, and Ottawa, the first thing Ottawa wanted, did was they sent out a geologist to find out what kind of goodies Canada got out of the deal for coal and ore and you know minerals. They sent this guy, George Mercer Dawson, who was an amazing fella. As you can see, he had a lot of physical challenges. He died young, real young, like Jimi Hendrix. And um, they call him the little giant. And he traveled throughout British Columbia. British Columbia he, was really hard to get through in those days. It's all these, these big, this coast range is hard to get through into the interior. And uh, BC is huge. It's over 10 degrees of latitude, uh, as much area as all 13 Atlantic coastal states from Maine to Florida. And like I say, very difficult terrain. So he would have had to travel through by river raft and by uh, horseback through the bush and all that. And these were tough guys. So he was a Victorian gentleman and he therefore was interested in everything. He kept, he learned uh, languages of indigenous people. He kept detailed notes on the weather and, and pressed plants and learned about everything. He just drank it all in. And he found fossil insects on the Similkameen River in Southern British Columbia. And that's the Allenby Formation in 1870 or so, or just 71, so right after BC, so 72, 73, I guess it would have been. And uh, that's the Allenby Formation. So the Allenby Formation insects have been known for 
you know, like I say, 150 years, but no odinates, none at all. So now we've got the first odinate. So BC, that's one of the reasons why there was all this built up stock of wonderful stuff for me to look at because BC insect, fossil insects were some, the, some of the more later fossil regions to be looked at by scientists. I mean, in, those sites in the US were easily accessible by railway and obviously the ones in Europe were easily accessible. So BC remained, a lot of it remained unexplored and hard to get to until recently. It wasn't until the 1950s, mid fifties that Fly and Phil Gallardi, the colorful minister of highways uh, opened up the interior by building this road system. We have a long history of colorful characters in <laughs> BC. So Fly and Phil Gallardi did that. And so now uh, I, looking at these is like the golden age of discovery, like I said. So I wanna finish with uh, one last, another project which is going on right now. Another rather large project about odonates. This is another, I talk about the discipline of, of taphonomy. Well, there's another discipline in paleontology I wanna in, inform you of um, called ichnology. And ichnology is the science of fossil traces. So trackways, nests, burrows, um, all sorts of leavings of the behaviors of, of animals with that, where you don't know what the body is. Like if you found these bird tracks and you didn't know a pigeon made them, uh, you'd name them using parataxonomy, you'd name them as a, as, as a group. And so you could know if you see the same ones at some other site or not, et cetera. And so odonates have a very interesting uh, ichno fossil uh, record. As you all know, many will lay their eggs uh, deposited in leaves that are either overhanging um, bodies of water or floating on bodies of water. And so here we find this beautiful record of leaves with uh, oviposition stars on them. So we've assembled a different team led by Conrad Lavendiera at the Smithsonian. Conrad has, has um, pretty well pioneered and, and built the, uh, the discipline of looking at insect feeding damage on leaves. And so we can, through a lot through his work, uh, through what he's created, we can look at sites that don't actually have insect fossils, but have lots of leaves. And we can tell a lot of things about the insect community that was there. So this is wonderful stuff. And Conrad's colleague, um, Jorge Santiago Blay, is uh, the two of them are, are leading this, this project. And a couple of paleobotanists, um, Kathleen Pig and Melanie DeVore, and myself and Rob Cannings and um, Rolf Matthews. So a bunch of us teaming up. Rolf looks at paleoecology, uh, he knows how these plants lived and what, what their environments were. Kathleen and Melanie are identifying the plants. So Jorge and, and Conrad can figure out whether these were made by the same, these are the same or different bunch of ichnotaxa. And we can look at whether they vary from site to site, whether they are consistent within plant types or whether they're just randomized throughout plant groups. You can also tell, for example, whether they were, they were laying eggs on live leaves that were overhanging the body of water, because then you'd have reaction tissue. You'd have the healing tissue around the oviposition site, or whether they were laid on leaves that were floating around after they had fallen, because there wouldn't be any healing tissue. So this project is ongoing, and uh, I don't know when this will be done but I'm look, very much looking forward to what we can find out on this project. And that's about it. That's, that's my story. Uh, here's all the different people that have worked on this project. And you, I think they're putting up uh, on this society's website, a link to download the Cephalozygopter paper for free, or you can go to Zootaxa and do a search for Cephalozygopter on the web, or you can email me and I'll send you anything. And at my website, there's a bunch of free downloads of PDFs. So fill your boots. Uh, and thank you for everyone. That's it. <laughs>